Hello, everybody. My guest today is John Cesar. He is a friend of mine. He is a, a social media mogul. He is um, a, a billionaire, a self-made billionaire. Uh, he's a classical guitar player. Um, and uh, he's a, a jokester. Hi, John. Hey, Ben. How are you doing? I'm good. Word. Cool. Um, so you're, you're not any of those things. Other, well, no, you're some of those things. You're kind some of those things. I mean, definitely not a billionaire in terms of, in terms of money. Definitely yeah. not. In but terms of love. Many people who are in terms of love, in terms of maybe in, in fun and good spirits, hopefully. Maybe. But, um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for asking me to do this. Yeah. Thank you for being one of the pioneers of, um, of this project. Uh, we're just quarantined and I want to talk to my friends and put it on the internet. Um, I got a phone call about mm -hmm. another episode I did uh, from my mother saying that it was very good. So uh, I'm sure uh, I'm sure my mother will like you too. Very cool. Yeah, I, I caught some of the one with your friend from Nashville. Yeah. Um, very cool. And d definitely very interesting. Totally seeing. I, I guess as classical guitarists, we get so into like kind of our own world of like you do this, then you do this, then you do this. And oftentimes we forget that for many musicians, honestly, if not most of them, it's not really a clear path. It's kind of like, well, I'm here, but now what? You know what I mean? It, exactly, it, it, yeah. It, yeah. It can be anything. We have a very uh, clear path, and, um, and that path is – you can deviate from that path, but you kind of know what you want to do, right? You either mm -hmm. want to perform or you want to teach or you want to record – but yeah. you're right, as other types of musicians, you kind of have to figure out how you're going to make a living. And like Ben Bishop was saying in, mm -hmm. in the, the first episode, um, you know, he just had to figure this out and talk to this person and talk to this person and network and, and communication, um, which is something you're really good at. You're really good at communication. So um, I want to talk about kind of your, your big picture and your big story. Um, but right now, yeah, well, let's just jump into it. Well, cool, okay. Before we before we get to the, all the cool stuff you're doing now, um, you know I don't even think I know the answers to these questions. How long have you been playing guitar in general? Um, so I'm am 26 now, and I started playing electric guitar like like many people do. Many classical guitarists do that is maybe when I was like 13 in seventh grade, um, and I, I did that for a few years. I, I took that fairly seriously. I was like very rigorous with it. I'm sure as many people were once they find that that's the thing they want to do. So I was, even in middle school, I was trying to practice like two or three hours every day. I would just go home from school, do whatever homework I had to do, and then sit down on my guitar and just pick out solos, pick out songs, um, and, and practice. Um, and then I started playing the classical guitar maybe going into my junior year of high school. So when I was probably about 16 going 17 by then. Um, and the reason why I did that was because um, pretty much by eighth grade, I knew I wanted to do something with music as a career. I knew I wanted to major in music. I didn't know what that meant, but I just knew I wanted to do that. And my teacher, by the time I got to sophomore year, my guitar teacher, by the time I got to sophomore year, was pretty much like, well, if you want to major in music for guitar, you have to either study classical or jazz. And then he said, well, I don't teach jazz. So if you want to study jazz, you have to find a different teacher. But I did do an undergrad in classical guitar. Um, Part, as part of my music ed degree. And I'm like, oh, well, I guess I'll do classical guitar. That sounds interesting. So, so you stayed with that teacher. So yeah, so, so, I, so I stayed with that teacher. Beautiful and, teacher tactic, by the way, for him to just say, you could ruin this relationship yeah. and play stinky jazz. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, continue, sorry. Yeah, no, no but um, and, and funny enough, actually, um, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously not going to say who the teacher is, but actually his view on jazz actually kind of was, he kind of didn't look down upon it. It's like he just didn't see the point in it as his most, mostly his background was as like a rock um, and like blues kind of guitarist who had which some. Is, which is basically like linked to jazz in a very intimate way, blues. It, it, it is definitely. Ironically enough, it really is, the lineage really is blues, jazz, then blues, jazz. It, it kind of, and then they kind of deviated to become their own thing. So, um, so I mean, yes, yeah, so, I mean, yes, totally a great teacher tactic. I mean, I definitely had a great connection with him. I felt like I was learning a lot while working with that teacher. So uh, I didn't want to, I didn't really want to change. And at the same time too, I was very involved by, I think f freshman year of high school, halfway through, I decided I wanted to play in band. Like I was just determined to play, do as many musical things as possible, whether it was chorus, band, select choir, wind, wind ensemble, and I didn't play a band instrument. So I didn't know, so how I learned how to read sheet music actually wasn't through classical guitar. It was 
ask my parents to go to the music store and rent a saxophone for me and then just show them to band class be like hey look i don't know how to play but i'm pretty good at guitar and i think i can get good at, I, I think i can get good enough to play with the parts here let me in the band and i was gonna guess snare drum because a lot of times with the kids that don't oh. know anything you go you're going to the snare drum yeah so well, you play the saxophone that's cool yeah, I mean, it was really fun. I mean, I think that was really what forced me because it was almost every day that I had to sit down with an instrument and look at sheet music and be like, well, okay, how do I do, how do I do that? Oh, that note's this, okay. And then part of my practice then became, literally was going home and going on musictheory.net and and just doing like the note trainer and yeah. trying to find yeah. different notes. And then I was like, well, now I need to get good at this at guitar. But by then I could kind of read sheet music. I could do read it fairly, fairly well, not... Um, polyphonic sheet music the way the guitar music is but i could read like one note at a time and i also knew how to play the guitar fairly well i knew chord shapes i knew where the notes were i had a basic understanding of i guess of the chromatic scale yeah and one thing i tell my students is that's very important just understand how the guitar works um right. so by the time i started actually playing classical guitar seriously i had i already had those things under my belt so it wasn't it wasn't crazy difficult for me to go from electric guitar to suddenly learning things through sheet music isn't that interesting? I, you, when you were saying that, it, it just, I had like that flashback to being, I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a little bit older than you, but not too much older. Yeah. I, I feel like um, when we were figuring out a lot of electric guitar things, we had to just sort of go online and, and just like watch a video. I remember like I downloaded and I probably like, uh, metaphorically wore the grooves out of this thing mm -hmm. uh which of course is impossible on a computer but i downloaded yeah. this live video of clapton playing layla and mm -hmm. now it's on youtube but it was on like kazaa or limewire or something mm -hmm. and i just watched it so many times to figure out exactly what he was doing and um and like that's even that's like the easy part right because i like pirated yeah. a video like and but it, what it made me think is like we had to do so many things to try to teach ourselves the sort of um, this really looked down upon, this really, it wasn't necessarily looked down upon, but it was really this unprestigious instrument. Yeah, I, I think that's one, that's one of the biggest things when it comes to when people ever ask, because so one of the things I do on my page is I do compare classical guitar to the electric guitar community in a way, and I'll get more into why I do that later. But, um, but like one of the things I, I definitely get, I intentionally stir up heat about, but also I get a lot of heat about is the kind of sheet music versus taps, um, guitar tablature that is. And one of my main thoughts on guitar tablature is really there's nothing wrong with it, honestly. But my main thought on it <clears throat> really has, really is, well, the people that we idolize so much, whether it's John Mishushi slash Jimmy Page, Jimi Hendrix, were those guys using tab when they were learning? Probably not. So why why do we feel like we have to? Why not, why, like why not just do it by ear like they like they did? You know what I mean? Yeah. We want to be like them, so why not Absolutely. try to be be like them? Um, but um, but yeah, no, I think it's I, I, um, back to what you said though. It's totally uh, interesting to kind of see like how when we were younger we had way less than what people nowadays have. Like now, if you want to if you want to learn the Layla solo, you could look up. And I do some with some of my electric students still. Is I'm like, well, let's go see if we can find five covers of that solo and see yeah. what they're doing. You know what I mean? And then you and you can slow stuff down on YouTube now. Um, yeah. There's tons of tabs out there, even if they're not wrong. They're usually pretty close, honestly. Like they're never they're never off by like they might be missing a note here or there. Um, Did you ever use um that software Power Tab? You know, ironically, I, I did actually. I think I didn't use that one. I used one that Opera. was no. I used one that was very similar. It was like a free version, but it was it was able the to open. Power tab was was free. Oh, then maybe. I have a whole. I remember they they were upset. Some, it was like because you could find those those Guitar Pro and Power Tab, um, files on like yeah. Guitar Nine One One or Ultimate mm -hmm. Guitar. And then I remember at one point they were like, we're getting rid of power tab. It's illegal. They're yeah. copyright infringement. And I have a zip like folder, like an, like a two yeah. gigabyte zip folder on my drive right now from when I was 16 of like every guitar, uh, a power tab song. Yeah, yeah. And I remember just like going through that and learning like really difficult music, like Steely Dan and dream theater and all this, this yeah. uh, r really eclectic stuff. Um, but that was the way to do it was it, at the time was to, to use that software. Now they have like news score and, um, 
I think there's another thing that you can, like Guitar Pro on your phone or mm -hmm. Ultimate Guitar has an app where you can just, uh, you can just watch whatever. So you're, you're a teenager, you're playing electric guitar. Mm -hmm. And then, so you, you pick up the saxophone, they put you in band, you decide that you want to do something with music. When do you go from, uh, you know, I might want to be a rock star. I might want to, I might want, you, when did you find your focus? Was it, was it your undergrad or was it before then? You know, th th that's a great question, honestly. I think I would say even there's even points where I still don't, don't know. I guess one thing is where myself is I've kind of kept, kept like one foot in the door um, in that like rock scene. And not so much in, my, in myself in terms of playing, even playing with electric guitar. I mean, I'll pick it up here and there, but I don't really have the time now to do it, I'm sure, as you know. Um, and it's nothing against it, obviously. It, it really comes down to a time thing. Um, but what I mean by like one foot in the door, I, so I have a very close friend. Um, he's done a few live streams with me on my, on my own page. Um, and he was in a band that was signed by Epitaph Records, who's the same label that owns like bands like The Wonder Years, um, Green, Green Day at one point, A Day to Remember, like a bunch of like punk rock um, or, or semi-hardcore bands. I and they do. Keep going. I, I think I know some bands that are. Um, and they were doing really well. They, 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 were, they, were open, they, did, they did a few concerts where they opened for The Wonder Years, they opened for The Menzingers. And... Um, and he was really involved in that. And then basically he w was, and me and him kind of lost touch, but once we, sorry, me and him kind of lost touch for, for a few years, but maybe in the last three years, we kind of regained our friendship, I guess, of what it was of being like kids that both loved playing guitar. Um, and even now I, I talked to him today because he just released a new single of his new band. And there's so many times where he's like, oh, you know, if we have a show, you got to come and like just play guitar for this thing. Or, oh, you got to come. And, um, and even just like, just like, just hit, hit down some chords on a synth for one of our sets. Um, and, you know, part of it is tempting just because he already has that in there. You know I mean? I know those shows are going to be definitely more fun than just joining your local band and playing the Webster Hall to like 10 people. You know what I mean? It's going to be... I'll tell you my Webster, my Webster Hall. So the, uh, what, what Webster Underground that is. Oh, I played the big room. Oh, nice. That, that, that's awesome. It was not awesome. Well, that's a, that's a story for later. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you're... So what did you do as you were sort of leaving high school? Um, so as I was leaving high school, I think one thing that happened to me is I actually, even going into early college, I think many, maybe many people face the same dilemma is I was like, well, I can still do this and I want, I want to get better at this, but I also want to get better at this. So in early college, I was trying to play electric, still playing in a band, still doing all that stuff while studying classical guitar. And I definitely got in the way, I would say, of that. Definitely, I would say, dented my progress, at least in terms of that at that point. Um, where where was your undergrad? So my undergrad was from a state school in New Jersey, Montclair State University. And who was your guitar, your classical guitar teacher? Do you would do you, can you share that? Yeah. So um. So while I was there, I worked mostly with the teacher Seth Hemelhoek, who's a great teacher. And I honestly definitely would not have the opinions and the the understanding, and more so, I guess, the connection of joy to the classical guitar if it weren't for him. Um, and. The one story I tell everyone is, and, and like I said, I feel like many people experience the same thing, is like, and I'm sure you did, when, when you go into, uh, into college, especially if to a state school for classical guitar, and you're decent, you can actually play a few pieces, right. you, you probably feel like, the, like the, the big dog there in terms of your, your guitar skill, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like, I thought, like, wow, you know, I'm playing some of these simple Bach preludes, I'm playing this, I'm playing these Renaissance pieces, and everyone else here can't even do the Segovia scales, like I knew most of them at the time, and... I played these like very hard pieces, well not very hard, but pieces that at the time were way beyond what I was doing then for right. Seth. And the first thing Seth said was like, oh, well that was that was nice. Let's do some Brower studies though. Um, and we did Brower one and four. And, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and then like I played them and like, I think I worked them a week and I'm like, I'm like, oh Seth, can we do this now? I can play the Brower studies. Uh, and he's like, well, let's hear them. And I play them. He's like, well, no, now you have to play them the way I want you to play them. <laughs> so, um, so then that, that was really where I think my, my eyes were open. Like, you know, I'm really not that good at this thing. And I really right. want to get better at this thing. I feel like that statement, I don't want to hang on that statement forever, yeah. but that statement of no, now you got to play them the way that I want you to play them. Yeah. is such that like, if you're not a musician, if you, if you haven't had a, that specific relationship with a teacher or with like a, a particular curriculum. Like I can think of a couple jazz people that would agree with that statement. Yeah. And I think like in general, that statement that you made is so, uh, it's such an idiom of classical music. And it's like, I, I can imagine a non-musician hearing that and being like, what are these, these guys are terrible. What's, do, 
are they yeah. do they exist to just strangle creativity but no you're right you you have to learn what well, you know just because you can read a sentence in another language doesn't mean that you can you you really understand that sentence or that book or that phrase or 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 whatever you can say the words but it doesn't necessarily mean anything so you're you're an undergrad let's let's skip ahead a little bit because okay, I, yeah. want, I want to move toward the present day okay so you're in undergrad and what what was the degree in so my, my undergrad was was actually also in the same as my master's which we'll get to um in classical guitar performance and i think it was maybe around my sophomore year, my undergrad, where I was like, you know what, let me put the electric guitar in the case, put it away, and really focus on this classical thing. Because then I was, because then like once I was making my teacher happy, I was like, and I started like maybe more real pieces, like Villalobos Prelude 1. I was like, you know what, I can really do this. And then we had like a guitar day thing, and the teacher was like, hey, you know, um, John, I think I think you would be, since you're one of the few performance majors here, I really want you to play in the master class for the guitar day thing. Um, mm -hmm. and that was like a, a, a great experience as well. You know, I mean, who was the teacher for the master class? So the teacher for the ma that master class was, uh, the guitarist, Jorge Caballero. Um, so and that was, that was <laughs> one hell of a, so it was my first a... master class. <laughs> yeah. And, um, <laughs> and, and I played prelude one. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I guess since, since then, that's kind of where things started going. I, as I kept, I'm sure, as you know, as I just kept going more into it, I kept seeing there was more and more that I didn't know. Yeah. And it was a, kind of that curiosity of like, oh, well, you know, like, I thought I played this piece well, and Jorge gave me like, oh, refinger this, make sure you're slowing down more here, make sure you don't pop the, the chords here. And I was like, huh, well, I got to go do this more then. And then I think it was good. And then Seth would be like, oh, well, no, you're doing that, but now you make sure you're doing this, because that wasn't obvious. And then it was this whole cycle. I think that was what really intrigued me about classical guitar and playing classical music versus playing rock music was there was always that like digging a little deeper within within one thing so i'm going to i'm going to butcher a quote here yeah um there is uh so the so i also well before the world shut down i yep. was studying um jiu jitsu a little bit and i yep. got i got pretty far with it not pretty far but i i did it for a little bit and mm -hmm. and was pretty into it um it, within my rank of of white belt and uh one of the things that I started doing was listening to these podcasts and there's this guy, Croiler Gracie, who's a young guy. He's actually a year younger than me. And uh, he's part of this big, you know, dynasty of, of Gracie jujitsu practitioners who are like the best in the world. And the whole idea of, of Gracie jujitsu or of jujitsu in general is that you're doing stuff on the ground. Yeah. And people think that if they go in there and they, they muscle their way through things through the ground, or they, they use a lot of strength that they're going to be a good fighter but that's not what it is. It's not a striking, it, for the most part, it's not about striking. Mm -hmm. And so he said, when you get somebody, it's a very intimidating thing. And this is why I think it's connected to classical guitar. Mm -hmm. He said, it's very intimidating because you get somebody in there and they, their mind is blown that you could do stuff on the ground. It's like somebody having never understood the concept of, an, of, of a large body of water. And then you bring them to the beach and show them the ocean. Yeah. And then while they're there, people are swimming in the ocean. So to me, that's a that quote hit home for classical guitar too, because you play the notes, right? Oh, yeah. I played I played the notes. Didn't I play the piece? No, no, you didn't play the piece. Okay. Yeah. Well, oh, I gotta play this note loud and this note quiet. Didn't I play the piece? No, you didn't play the piece. And so you it's not this thing where you're you're going for me, you're going yeah. further, but you're going deeper. Would you agree with that? I, I think I think so totally. I think, um, and I think that's one thing that kind of to segue back to even what we were talking about with teaching, or when people realize that is, I think that's one thing that's very um, that's very important for teachers to definitely instill in their students at a very early stage. Not that they're going to tell them all the stuff that they maybe can't understand at the time, but let them always know there's more to it than is on is on the page or that they're starting off with. Um, and I think that. When that's when that's done well, that's when the student can have that sense of discovery. And I think I was lucky enough to have that in my rock guitar playing. Where like I, I show up and I would play these chords. Like oh well, no, I'm hearing these extra notes here. Or, oh, you know, like that bend was a little bit out of tune, or that that gliss could have been a little smoother. Um, so I, I got the idea. I got like I, got, I think I got the concept there, but I think the concept was really expanded upon when I saw how much there really was the classical guitar. Yeah, you and then it's funny when you try to bring them back over to electric guitar you feel like a king because you're like, yeah. 
you know, there's so many things you don't have to worry about with electric guitar, but that's another, that's another bag yes. to, to unpack. Um, so you, uh, when did you first get familiar with, it sounds like you and I had a very similar situation with yeah. undergrad where we were at a state school. Mm -hmm. the, the music department, I'm guessing, was probably okay. And mm -hmm. the guitar instruction was probably pretty darn good. Um, and, but when did you start, when did you meet the Hartford people? When did you meet Chris and Dick and all, um, all of them? So I got to know them very well through one of the Hart Guitar Festivals. And I think I went to a few, the, up until then, the only guitar festival I ever went to besides the Hart one was the one at the Manus School in New York City. Um, and that one was great. I mean, that one, um, for anyone who hasn't gone, and hopefully if it runs this year, maybe not, with, thing, with however things are going on, and also granted being in New York City, that is. But um, that one's great because a lot of people signed up, and they oftentimes they get a lot of pretty good artists to play. So you have every night's a great concert of somebody that you would normally not get a chance to see because they're usually touring Europe or touring, touring Canada or touring somewhere else. And, um, and there was a lot of people there all at totally different levels. There was kids there that were playing circles around undergrads. There was graduate students that were playing circles around DMA students. There was adults that were just getting back into it. There was high schoolers that were amazing. There was high schoolers like me that was just kind of getting started. Um, New York it, will do that to you. Right. Yeah, it, 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 was, it was an awesome mix, definitely. But I think what made the Hart School then stand out so much, because that was my first experience then, when then going to visit the Hart Festival, it was pure, from what I got at least for my first time, uh, when it was with, I think the first time I did it was with Jason Vio. Um, but was how focused it was on like the actual learning process and really seeing like how much someone like Chris and Chris, Christopher Lyon and uh, Dick Provost really went into those things I was curious about, such as like phrasing and connecting and singing, just seeing how they worked with the students and then seeing how my own playing um, moved from then. I definitely saw there was some gaps in what I was missing in my own studies, which isn't a bad thing. I think wherever you are, there's always going to be gaps. And I think that's why you need to reach out. Um, and I think, from where I was then, though, that was where I saw my gaps, the gaps in my playing or the gaps in my learning being filled the most, I think. Mm. So was that it, the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I was, I was going to kind of say it was really, it was really that, that kind of really acquainted me with like the heart guitar program and the heart school and Chris. Right. Was that the, the concert where Jason swapped out the, the sore for the grand overture? Like the first, he just came out and played the grand overture instead of, uh, it might have been, from what I remember, that was when we actually went to see, we went to see him in that not that that like years. I'm, oh. I'm thinking if that was because I saw him at Heart and then we all went out to dinner. It might have been. Let me think. What, what year that that was? Two thousand. I was a junior in college, I think. No, I was a I was a sophomore in college, going into my jun going into my junior okay. year. I, um, I think it was it was before I did my masters. I think so. so that was two thousand fourteen. I want to say. Oh. Um, summer of 2014. It was a long time ago. Yeah, no. So, um, so you eventually make your way to Hartford. Mm -hmm. You you go from a state school uh, education, and I say yeah. that with a with a badge of honor that you of share, uh, to a conservatory, to a true conservatory. What was that? You know, what was that transition like? Um, I would definitely say that it was maybe easier than for me than others. One, um, because by then, like I mentioned, I already knew the teachers at heart. You know what I mean? Like my, my audition was very, very lax in that. Like when I went there, they were like, Chris, like, hey, John, how are you doing? Well, come on in. You're, 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 or where else are you? You'll be next. You know what I mean? It was very, it was very friendly because it was very familiar to me. Um, and then going to the program, I already knew how, and up until then also, I also visited the school a few times too. So I already knew how, um, how they ran some of their classes. I already knew how they taught. So I had an idea of what to expect, at least the guitar program. And going into a master's degree, at least at heart, the guitar program is like most of what your degree is. You have a few other um, music electives here and there, but most of your degree is the guitar program. And I had an idea of that, what that was like. Um, outside of that, though, I think going from a state school music program, um, I was lucky in that my state, the state school I went to had a very strong music program just because it was so close to New York City. Uh, so I got to work with some very, very good violin teachers or flute teachers in chamber music, some very good theory teachers in the composition department. I mean, I was really lucky in that. Um, but I think the biggest thing that was eye-opening to me was, wasn't was necessarily the, the level of 
of what they taught, how good the teachers were, but it was more so the level of what they expected and the level of everyone else coming in there and seeing like, wow, you know, like I was, again, state school, you're like, wow, you know, I'm like the, like the big dog here in terms of even like my theory, I was the only people that maybe that were able to do better at like um, ear training stuff or like we had a class of counterpoint that can make better, like a simple few better than I could was like the comp majors. And I go here and there's people that are studying theory that would blow me and all the comp majors from my undergrad out of, out of the water. Um, yeah, I, I left my undergrad being able to outplay anybody in the mm -hmm. department. But the department was also, the, the guitarists were dwindling. They had all yeah. graduated or left the program. And then at that point, Chris put all of his eggs, well, he, he left Central to go to Hart yeah. because that's where the, the kids were. That's where the students were. Yeah. And that, that was a job that he deserved and, and I'm glad that he got it. Mm -hmm. um, so there was really nobody left. But even before that, I was always the, the you know, the top dog. Um, and then I got to heart and I was like on the bottom rung, barely. Like I yeah. was getting my my butt handed to me. Oh, yeah. Totally. Um, so you had mentioned, I, I want to kind of talk about what you do now. Yeah. You had mentioned earlier that you have always seen yourself a part of your identity is having one foot, one, one foot here, one foot there, having your hands in many different uh, pots, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and I, I definitely, I would agree with that. It, it seems like you're, you're very good at, at keeping a lot of things up on the surface. Mm -hmm. What do you, what are you doing now other than um, teaching and, um, well, just why don't you just go through the stuff that you're doing now? We'll we'll get to the so the cool social media stuff when we get to it. Cool. So um, I guess what I'm doing now, you said it. I guess I am teaching. I'm fairly. I'm trying to get fairly involved in the Suzuki guitar community now. Um, I think that's something I definitely see. Something I want. I really want to pursue as a teacher, but also as I guess as where it sounds like because they sound the same thing. But as a teacher, but also as an educator, I guess. Um, like really be well known in the Suzuki community as a, a good Suzuki guitar teacher, and also be a good Suzuki guitar teacher, even though that sounds like the same thing in a way. I would say there's, there's definitely a difference. Absolutely um, a difference. Absolutely. And, and I guess why that is, because my first teacher, Seth Hemelhoek, who I mentioned, was one of the guys who actually founded the Suzuki guitar method back in the 80s. Um, oh. And um, and the whole time I was studying with him, he would always be referencing how he has, like, oh, this is a, a piece one of my Suzuki kids is doing. And, he, and even when I was learning with him, he would say, hey, why don't you play this A2 from book Suzuki book seven or book eight? And I was like, okay, cool. And then he's like, oh yeah, like one of my kids who's like ten is playing this. And I'm like, and I was just like, how do you ha how do you get a ten year old to play classical guitar that well? And he showed me some videos of his kids, and they were like, they were very good. Um, and the main thing he would always say is like, yeah, like I'm I'm an okay teacher, but with the kids, I think it's really the method. Um, and okay. I never and I didn't really get into it until maybe two years ago. I finally did I finally did my first Suzuki guitar my teacher training for book one, and there was just a lot of things that I respected about like kind of the way it's taught. And there was a lot of things that I connected to the way I was taught, even, even at heart. And there's tons of stuff that I pull from the way I work with Chris, I worked with Chris or Dick and mm -hmm. I put that into um, the way I teach Suzuki guitar in a way, some, some elements. So that's one big thing I'm trying to get involved in. Um, even today I was, I'm actually working on recording all the teacher parts, all the uh, teacher accompaniment parts for book one at three different speeds to send my students to play along with during the week, especially because everything's online. Um, my plan is to do that, make like a nice video for them with, with cues and stuff, and then send it off to the Suzuki guitar listserv so other Suzuki guitar teachers can hopefully use it with their students. Um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's really cool. I, um, the year you did your, your, your book one training last summer, correct? I think it was two summers ago, but yeah, n not that long ago. I remember last I don't remember why I couldn't do it because it, it's always like the same like June, July date. Uh -huh. And I remember last year I couldn't do it because my son was born. And then of the course, year before yeah. that, I was like, no, I can't do that. And then the year before that, I, I don't remember why I, I, there was a, there was a, a conflict. Mm -hmm. um, so you're doing that. What, what are you doing um, performing and playing wise? So performing and playing wise, I guess it's kind of like what you said, the whole one foot in the door. There was one, one point where I was trying to do as many like theater shows, musical things as possible. My, my, my logic with that kind of was like, well, you know, I'll have more time to practice the stuff I want to do if I'm not teaching as much and I just do these shows to kind of make money. And those all got canceled, obviously, because of the whole virus thing. And in a way, it was kind of like a blessing in disguise, at least that part for me was. 
Um, cause I was like, you know what? Like, I don't know how much I really want to do these. You know, I want to spend my time just playing classical guitar and getting as good as I, as I can get with that. And that really kind of showed a light of meaning like, like if those shows didn't work out in anything, if I had some classical guitar concerts, those wouldn't have worked out. But knowing that both those wouldn't have worked out, which one would I have done anyway was kind of my thought process. Right. And it was obviously the, the classical stuff. Um, so performing wise right now, I mean, I used to play tons of restaurant gigs. I used to play tons of weddings with classical guitar. That was fun. I, I probably still would in a way. But right now, my, my goal is, to, is currently to work up a, pro, a new concert program and hopefully concertize with that in the fall or maybe the spring next year. Uh, my concert program now is actually very much consisted of Suzuki repertoire, mostly the book nine stuff. For classical guitarists, that would be Requeros de la Alhambra, uh, Capriccio Rabe, Asturias, and the Soy Mozart variations. Those are the, the four big pieces in book nine. And the whole, whole soror is in there? Mm-hmm. The and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm doing that for the, for the, um, for the program primarily because um, I want to start hopefully trying to appear, play and get to get, like I said, more well-known in the Suzuki guitar community and do hopefully do concerts for my students or at different Suzuki schools. And one of the things my students love is whenever I pick up their guitar, I'm like, oh, let me play a book, a book nine piece on your guitar. And right. they're like, wow, that was so cool. I can't wait till I get to book nine. Um, so I'm like, well, why not just have a program that's all book nine stuff, especially if I'm playing to a lot of Suzuki kids. So, um, and it, it also coincidentally lines up with audition stuff too, to be certified to get into book nine, you have to play book nine pieces so it's kind of a, it's kind of a win-win for me i did not know i think we're gonna have to do a whole a whole episode on suzuki guitar sometime that'd be awesome I'm, I'm quite ignorant to this um so so you're doing that you're working on on current program obviously unless you're you're somebody you know who is has so much fame and clout that you can start streaming and getting money which those people probably don't i mean i doubt eminem needs to or Lady Gaga really needs the money right now. No. Um, unless you're one of those people, you're probably not making too much for performing right now. So you're finding time to work on your craft, which I think is awesome. Um, and then here comes the social media account that started off as like a, a way to create humor. I, so I was yeah. looking at this today. I guess let's just start. Let's, I'm not going not gonna to try to make it sound fancy. You have a, a, an Instagram account called For the Classical Guitarist. Mm hmm it's on its on the surface it's like a jokey meme page in a way yeah totally and that's definitely how it started but now there's stuff in there that's extremely informative it's for the classical guitarist yes so there's you have interviews with some of the big social media people mm -hmm. um hannah murphy phil gold did you do phil i, I did not i'm going to do him i am planning to do a second season around of, of sure. like interviews um and definitely with that i'm planning to do one with phil goldenberg um and a few other people that i know that i think would have just have different interesting points of view on music and on right. guitar one of the cool things is that you now and i think this was maybe somewhat intentional with your mm -hmm. idea of being a little bit of everywhere at once is once you have gathered everybody's i think there's a great thing gathered everybody's attention with like the funny stuff then you can show them the stuff that's really cool. And because they're, they already know that they can, are they familiar with you, that they can trust you. They say, Oh, I am going to watch this thing with, uh, with Frazier yeah. or, Dross, or with Sarah Badlisi, or I'm going to check, read out his, his thing about, you know, tremolo on tremolo on tremolo or, yeah. or, or whatever. Um, what is your, well, how did that start? And, and what is your, um, What's your path that you're currently taking with it? So I guess how, how it started, there's two things that really come to mind. Uh, thing number one is my friend who I went to, one of my friends who I went to high school with, he was another another guitarist, singer guy that was playing in bands and he really liked like uh, punk, uh, pop punk, pop punk music bands like Blink-182, Green Day, Simple Plan, um, and, and so on. And he had a pop punk band that was okay. It wasn't bad. It was just, if, if I showed it to anybody that didn't know who it was, they would be like, oh yeah, this is just your any, every other day average slash maybe slightly mediocre high school pop punk band. Not bad, but there's nothing really special about it. So why would I listen to this when I could listen to, like I said, the other bands I listed. And he ended up going to school for music business at Oneonta. Um, did fairly well. He got, I think he has like a small time job now working for a record label. 
um, d d designing like logos and stuff for different brand, uh, bands and stuff or, or artists. And I think somewhere around 2016, maybe 2017, he made an, an Instagram account called the Pop Punker, right? Or Punker for short. And it was pretty much just him uploading memes about pop punk humor, whether it was making fun of um, a song by The Killers, a song by Blink-182, a song by Good, uh, Good Charlotte, whoever, whoever it is. And he was making these memes. And, and the whole idea was it shows like it showed like the pop punk community, how people that listen to that music will see the joke and get that. And that kind of got me thinking about memes more as weird as that sounds, because up until maybe 2017, like my thought of memes was just like they're kind of like comical things that can be maybe slightly offensive, slightly funny, whatever, whatever they are, right? whatever you whatever type of meme you like. Um, and my 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 realization to memes then, as it sounds so fun, weird to talk about memes like in a serious context, but but it is, it really like, is, is like is 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 that like, dude? You're closing in on thirty. You gotta no no, but um, but 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 no, it, it sounds really weird. But the, the thing with what makes memes so interesting to me is that it really is like you want to, if you don't get the joke, you either want to figure out the joke, and if you get the joke, you like being in the crowd. You know what I mean, like. And that's what made the pop punk Absolutely. one so familiar because it was only other people that like pop punk that would get the joke. If I showed to my mom a joke about like Mr. Bright talking about the killers, she would she wouldn't laugh even if it was the, the funniest thing ever. She'd be like, "Oh, okay, good, I guess. I, I don't get it." Um, but when I showed it to somebody who, who's in that circle, they're like, "Oh, this is so funny. Oh, you like pop punk too? Oh, cool. You gotta check out this." And then it's like kind of a community centered around this thing through memes. And the thing with memes is that's great with them is that they're so accessible. I mean, they're, they're photos with minimal text. Um, and like, what's gonna make, what's gonna draw someone in more? A photo of, a fo so the, the killers one I'm thinking of is there's a picture of a dog outside of a cage and it just says like, I'm doing just fine up top. And it's a dog out of the cage. So coming out of my cage, I'm doing just fine. And what's gonna be funnier, a text describing that like joke? Like, oh, imagine if there's a dog out of his cage or just a photo of a dog outside of his cage with a text and I'm doing just fine below it. Um, and it's definitely a way to, to grab people's attention It is, and then make them think about what just happened. It and is. I don't mean that in a crass way. You're, you're right. When you think about it, there's something very accessible to it. And especially the way that we view social media and the way that we use social media, which is like pr pretty quick, right? We're, we're like, we're on this post, we go to this post, we go to this post. We're either highly invested in it or we move on. And so delivering something in that kind of bite-sized uh, uh, capsule is, or, or what, what, I don't know, you don't really bite capsules. Yeah, yeah. But delivering something like that, I think, is, uh, is, is interesting. Yeah, well, it totally is. And then, um, so basically, let's kind of speed up the story, though. Basically, so, he, so his page started doing very well. I think I checked it maybe 2017, had like 60,000 followers. And today it has like 130 thousand followers or something and somewhere probably around the 80,000 mark of him doing this he was um people were always messaging me like oh do you have a band do you do anything because they was like who is this guy who is this guy that runs the pop punker page and he was like well i don't have a band anymore but i used to i'll start releasing some songs of mine and he released the exact same song that was in high school the same one that i said was maybe the slightly mediocre pop punk band and Within like a week, it was like one of the top pop punk hits on Spotify. It was added to Spotify playlists with bands like Brand New, um, Taking Back Sunday, Green Day, whatever. Um, and his and then he's starting to get all these like these like checks from Spotify then because people love his music. And if you go to if you go on YouTube and look at the songs, all the comments are like, "This is the best pop punk song ever." And again, it was no, it's no different than what was there before. And what I realized is because they liked him, they they liked the pop punker. They, they didn't like my friend. His name is Ben. They, they didn't like Ben as well. They, they, they didn't like Ben. They liked the pop punker or they liked punker. And because they like punker, anything punker says, whether it's his music, someone else's music, is going to have some weight to it. And and that got me thinking in terms of, well, why isn't there anything like that for a classical guitar? I mean, like, like we, we're an equally, I would say, as, like, we equally have our own inside jokes within our own community whether it's making fun did you of, see the oscar gilia one today i i did yeah that um, is funny i did see that um and the thing is and the thing is the, the one before that was actually was a post about playing by the the page uh memes for classical guitarists um the one that it was one that was like playing for renee Escardo, and like my first comment value looking at any of the comments was like 
you guys haven't played for Oscar yet. And I open the comments and I see there's like one or two other comments already saying that. And it shows the whole idea of the sense of community. I mean, like we get right. these jokes. And like I showed, again, I showed my mom it. She wouldn't care. But right. other classical toys like that. They, they like they like feeling in on the joke. Um, Especially because we're part of a community that is, I mean, we're on the outside of everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you, and I'm not saying poor us, I mean, we're, we're very privileged to be able to spend the amount of money that we did on our education. Oh, yeah. But in terms of like respect in the conservatory, they don't really respect us mm -hmm. because we can't really do too much. Uh, and then, you know, it, it, well, I play guitar. Oh, that's so cool. What kind of guitar do you play? Classical guitar. Oh, okay. So like Beethoven. Yeah. And then the conversation yeah. ends. So it's, it's, it's like this thing that people don't understand. And it's, you're right. We invest so much time and money and energy and, and years of our life to studying this stuff. And it, it's funny to be able to, to geek out with, um, with those, those kinds of people. We talk a lot about, I mentioned to you a lot about mm -hmm. the similarity in, in like the watch collecting community. Yes. Yeah. Well, a couple of years ago, um, these watch memes accounts started popping up. And some of them are um, just like kind of what you do, like funny inside joke memes. Some of them take stabs at like the establishments of, of yeah. like the uh, the infrastructure of watch collecting. And um, yeah, you're right. On the on the surface, it's like yeah, who cares? But it means something to people that get it. So you have this you have this account. It's I think around five thousand followers right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're not going to get any from this because nobody's going to watch this other than my mom. Um, but what, what are you starting to do with it now? What are you seeing its potential to not just have a f the followers because the followers, whatever, but it's the voice in the community. What are you, what are you seeing that that's happening because of this? Um, I think I'm seeing, I'm getting a lot more interest in my opinion, as weird as it sounds, and this isn't in a conceited way, my opinion is getting much more validated than it would be, I would, I would say, without it. Um, I mean... I, I didn't know this Instagram account for a few years. I post videos of me playing. I post videos from concerts, from recitals, and they would get some likes. They would, people would be like, "Wow, nice job. Um, that was good." No one was ever negative, um, but I wasn't getting messages that were like, "Wow, you're really good. What, what are your thoughts on this?" You know what I mean? And with this account now, almost every day I get at least a message being like, "Hey, look at me. Look at me doing this." Or like, I'll get a tag of someone tagging. Even like zero men. Uh, I think it's Men Mendez or uh, Ellie Fisk's wife, though. Like, she even tagged me in, like, a post that she was doing. And I think she did it accidentally. But I messaged her back, and I was, I was like, thanks for the tag. <laughs> and, she, she, and she was just like, you're welcome. And, like, there's, there's these, these ins that I wouldn't have, have, have I don't think, um, without it. So I think now my, my challenge that I'm trying to figure out with this whole thing, though, is, like, how do I take this thing that's kind of now, like, a, like still, like, a meme page, humor page, and turn it into something more serious, but also make them like me. And that's where I've really been invested, kind of part two of which is what motivated me a lot is YouTubers. Um, as I mentioned to you before, I follow almost all the big electric slash contemporary music YouTubers. Um, and oddly enough, I realize that's something that a lot of musicians don't do. I mean, a few people, probably a lot of people know Adam Neely, but not many people follow like Mary Spender or Samurai Guitarist. And Samurai Guitarist is... He, okay. He's a cool guy. He's yeah. Cool. Who was the, what was the second video that you posted with the bebop solo? You know, that one, I actually don't know. I, I, I saw that video a while ago because the other thing do, I do, especially with my page now, is I really try to follow internet trends, like see things that are going on and see what other people are talking about. You know what I mean? Like with the I'm whole- I'm going to pull it up. I'm going to pull it up right now. A, a good example is like the whole, the whole Ed Sheeran like lawsuit case where he was getting sued by Marvin Gaye. They were, I, as soon as I dropped, I followed like, I watched every major YouTube videos on that, thoughts on that. Same with the Nick Jonas one. That's why when you posted that, I was like, oh, I could send him these two videos. Like, I knew yeah. exactly which ones to send you. And um, and my other thought was like, well, why aren't there any YouTubers for the classical guitar? At least in the same way they are. They are. Like, there's tons of YouTube channels that are about like, oh, here's how you do this technique, or here's like my thoughts on this book or this edition. But there's no like fun, like modernized content for classical guitar on YouTube. And my question still is, why not? I, I still don't know, don't know the answer to that. But Another thinking is, well, if there's not, like, why don't I make it? And hopefully I'll get in the people that like the kind of stuff I do on Instagram, but now on YouTube is, is, my, is my, new, my new goal. Hold on. We're going to launch this really quick. You, you said before, um, 
you said before that uh, there was somebody that you had met in your 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 crossings that said they didn't really see the point of jazz or to something of that extent. Yes. That's kind of loud. Hold on, let me turn it down a little bit. I feel like if you if you need to understand why you should be interested in jazz, it should be interesting. Because I was like, what is this guy going to do, right? Like, yeah, I, I, so, yeah, the first time I saw that, I thought that was great. Um, and there's it's so good, one, too. And, and there's one more of those I was going to send you, actually. I'll send it to you later tonight. Um, it's it's a little bit more, it's a little more slightly immature. It's by YouTuber uh, Stevie T. I don't know if you okay. see him. He's an insane, like, shred metal guitarist, but... We're going to watch the next, like, I like the next, like... <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's great, and um, and, and that's the thing is like it's like he's he's clearly making fun of like pop culture, he's making fun of jazz in a way, right. um, and like, wh wh where is the classical guitar in that? You know what I mean? It's it's been yeah. around longer. You know I mean, it, it definitely could, um, it definitely could be in there. I think part of why it people don't like people don't like classical guitar or they don't really know about it is because there isn't anything out there for people that don't really play classical guitar. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so and, am I? Am I? Yeah. Am I right in saying, because you've said a lot about your personal goals with the page of like, mm -hmm. I want to get to, I want to be able to reach more people. I want yeah. people to, to like me for what I have to offer. But what is then the, like the duty that you have to classical guitar? What do you want to share? Is it stuff for the classical guitarist or is it stuff to grab people that would say oh those are the weird guys with the long fingernails to oh this is really pretty music i didn't know that there was such a you know like julia florida right mm -hmm. is like oh one of the the pieces that you could play for somebody that's never heard classical guitar and they might fall in love with it or the cathedral or mm -hmm. um uh you know landa or something like that so are you i guess my question is do you feel like you want to be grabbing people outside of that realm or just sort of service the community that's already there or both? Um, I, I think it's definitely the second thing you said. It's definitely grabbing people from outside the realm. And my, my thought of that is back to the YouTube because I, I really, it really comes down to who I look, who I guess I look up to as content creators and like how, what are they doing? And as, as, um, I mentioned most musicians don't follow many music YouTubers. Like a lot of people know like two set violin and stuff, but not many people follow like a lot the more like the more direct educational ones in a way. And however, these guys have like close to a million subscribers on the YouTube channels, and a company like Tonebase has like a thousand. You know what I mean? Like how does that happen? You know what I mean? How does a company have less than one person? Um, and and what do you think? Um, and well, well, my thinking is. Because people like a person, you know what I mean. As weird as that, that sounds, very obvious and also kind of weird, but it's also super true. Um, but um, but if you look at Tonebase's audience, people that subscribe to Tonebase, I'm almost a hundred percent sure that every single one of them is a classical guitarist, if not somebody who is maybe really trying to get motivated into classical guitar. If you look at the, if but if you look at the subscriber base of a YouTuber like someone like Music Is Win. Mm -hmm. Most of them are probably not professional guitarists. The people that maybe play one or two chords, maybe like maybe dream one day of being able to play the Freebird solo, but but just aren't, just aren't there yet. And they maybe never will. Maybe guitar isn't a priority of their life. But it's fun to have a community of guitarists that, again, can laugh the same jokes, can learn the same things, can be like, oh, I never knew that. That's cool. I'll I'll, I'll go home and practice and practice now. Um, where a company like Tonebase is really for professional classical guitarists that are trying to or aspiring professional classical guitarists that is. Is that then the, the, does the, the fact that somebody like tone base or mm -hmm. somebody uh, like Adam Neely, uh -huh. does that, is that discrepancy because of the nature of the content? Meaning if I want to create a, a, a space where you can study classical guitar, mm -hmm. am I doomed 
to uh, to fight an uphill battle more so than having the advantage if I'm just going to say this is Ben's guitar page and I'm going to do stuff to grab your attention. So I get I guess the question that I'm asking is is that is that discrepancy in followers sort of built into the infrastructure of the way that we we view music? I think it's built in I think it's not necessarily the way we built that we view music. I think it's the way we view things in general. Um, for and that's why I think it really is like yeah, you obviously want to have content that's good, content that people like, but it's really how that content is presented, which is I think which is what it is. Um, for example, if you look at any of the tone based videos, even if it's with someone great, it'll be like some guy just probably sitting in a very nice, very like blank back wall room, right? Maybe with some paintings, something nice maybe. And he'll have his guitar and he'll be like, hey guys, today we're going to be learning how to do blank. So first thing we want to do is this. And like the information might be, he might be saying great, maybe he might be t saying it in a very, very well structured, very thought out, very clear way. But unless if you're like dedicated to learn that thing, whatever that thing is, whether it's tremolo, building scale speed, arpeggios, whatever it is, um, why would you why would you want to spend your time your, your time your maybe the the few time you have to play guitar watching that when um when there's also now youtubers like let's say with electric guitar that they'll come in and it'll be like something like fun like cbt who has like a fun desk behind this thing with all these other weird gizmos and he's like making jokes about, he's making pop culture references but he's also teaching you about i don't know what what gent is for example he's teaching you about like or even like music theory, like Adam, Adam Neely does tons of videos on like weird rhythms, like polyrhythms, for example, but he does them in a much more interesting way as opposed right. to just being like, hey guys, I'm gonna teach you about how to do a seven, seven over 11 polyrhythm. He actually breaks it down, has cool animations. He has, um, he does it outside of 7-Eleven. He, he explained, he like actually maps it out really well. And it really is how the content is presented. I think that's just because the modern age, like if you look at all of their followers, they're all in their age range, I wanna say from 16 to like 38, from what I've gathered from most of them. Um, and they've said so, it in, in so, interviews. So yeah. that's funny that you, cause I have no doubt that uh, some of these people can really play. Like I, I have no yeah. problem saying this cause I'm never gonna, this, this is never gonna blow up, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, like Rick Beato, he's yeah. a fine player. Mm -hmm. um, I can't stand his videos. Like, yeah. Just because I, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to watch the top ten uh, uh, coolest color picks, you know. Yeah, yeah. But then when I saw him play like the Larry Carlton solo from mm -hmm. Steely Dan's Kid Charlemagne, I was like, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, he's he's a good player. So I guess the the thing is like these people, they amass these followers, and then it's almost like they trick you, uh, and that's a very cynical way. And I'm sure they don't see it like that. I'm sure mm -hmm. they're saying like, I have now, I can do the stuff that I really want to do. Yeah, because uh, I, you know, I'm sure the top ten videos are fun, but to to geek out over um, a polyrhythm is probably a, that's a more of a fun video. So if I'm the consumer and I'm looking on YouTube, mm -hmm. then you know. I guess the way that you would find a YouTube follower is something that's going to grab their attention yeah, or something that they're looking for. But I would say it's probably more of the former because like if I'm looking up a walkthrough on Dark Souls and I get the information that I want, mm -hmm. I'm not going to click subscribe unless that person brings me in with like humor, really, exactly. good, inf really good information, yeah. uh, really good production quality, things that I think I'm going to need for the future. I'll hit yeah. subscribe. So if I'm a guitar player and I, or if I'm a, an amateur guitar player or somebody that, that, you know, has a guitar hanging up on my wall and never touches it like this mm -hmm. beautiful guitar, mm -hmm. I might subscribe to one of those guys that has the funky desk yeah. and the funny voice. And then when he does the polyrhythm video, I might be like, oh, okay, watch a few minutes of it and then scroll on past it. Yeah. I was just going through a, I guess a personal journey yeah. right there. Well, with that. no, no, that, that, that's that's totally good. And the thing is, like, I mean, again, like I said, a lot of those things, cause like for someone like you or someone like me, like a lot of these things we know, obviously. So it's like kind of like, well, and like my big thing thing is like, if there was a classical guitar, guitar YouTuber that was talking about like tremolo, te they had like all these funny things, and then they did a video about tremolo technique. Technique. Me as a classical guitarist. Who am I gonna to wanna to watch them or like Scott Tennant talk talk about tremolo? You know what I mean? Like, 
as a classical guitarist, I'm obviously going to pick Scott Tennant. But if I don't really know a whole lot about classical guitar and I see, oh, this guy, I like a few of his videos. He has a few funny videos and he's talking about this technique called tremolo. Huh, what's that? And, oh, here's this old, older looking bald guy talking about tremolo. I don't know who that is, but I, I've, I've seen this guy's videos before. I'll watch that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think it really, it really comes down to knowing your audience. Um, Meanwhile, he's got like the best tremolo on the on the planet. Well, and that, that's exactly what it is. Though the thing is, we, we wouldn't know. And the thing is, though, the guy that talks with that those videos, I'm sure if they know what they're doing, they'll be like, oh yeah, if you want to see some really good tremolo, definitely check out Scott Tennant or check sure. out David David Russell or John Williams or whoever. And or Scott um, Tennant twice. Yeah, yeah, and they'll they'll probably even like stress Scott Tennant, but yeah. at the same time you're already there for them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, maybe if you're really invested, maybe like, wow, you know, I trust this guy and he says to check out Scott Tennant. Let me find who that, out who that is. That's awesome. I mean, that's definitely, that's probably hopefully why that person is doing what they're doing. But so then is this a question then of, yeah. of pop culture? Is this just a question of, um, is this, because the way that we're talking about, it makes me think like, this is just an issue that has always existed and will always exist. It, you know, if you, um, if you're trying to persuade somebody to see something the way you see it, but the only, the only reason that you see it mm -hmm. is because you've spent years studying it. I mean, we talked about it at the beginning of the conversation about how, when we both started, uh, well, you said this and I agree, you start classical guitar and you're like, yeah, I get it, mm -hmm. but you don't get it. Oh, okay. Well, I get it yeah. now. No, you still don't get it. And mm -hmm. two years after my master's degree, there's things I'm thinking about being like, oh, I think I get that now. So, is it just a question of we're always going to be on the outside uh, trying to get people to let us in or bring them out there with us? I, I just wonder if that's just a human nature thing. I, I think it totally is. And I think that's why, I mean, obviously, obviously there's just a lot more electric guitarists than there are classical guitarists. And there's definitely a lot more amateur electric guitarists than there are amateur classical guitarists. But I think the reason why is because what many people see is there isn't really room to be, there isn't any space to be an amateur classical guitarist. It's kind of like, oh, you play classical guitar, but you're not that great. Okay, well, I don't want anything to do with you. You know, you know what I mean? And with the electric guitar community, you could be playing the same power chords, playing the same pentatonic scale, and you could find a bunch of people that are equally that and are, are willing to have a good time with just that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I, I definitely feel that way from the inside of the, of the classical guitar circle, but I'm not sure what do you, th what, how, how, when you said that about how, if you're not good, people don't want anything to do with you. I feel like that might not be true when it comes to fans, because yeah. I've seen some people freak out over some really terrible yeah. classical guitar players. I don't know if it's so much as it has to do with fans. For me, I think it has to do with them. You know what I mean? Like, and that, that's the big thing is, is it really is like, do people like you? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and th that, that's the thing is, is, is it's weird. That's kind of the thing I, I, I've been telling people a lot lately what I'm trying to do with my page is I want people to like me as weird as it sounds. And I don't mean that in like a sad way. Like I want people, I, I just want everyone to like me. I mean that in like a, they need to know me enough to have an opinion on me at all. You know what I mean, and yeah. Um, and, and I think that's, to that's totally it. I think it is the same thing with pop culture too. For example, there's tons of people who are not great singers that are, famous being singers because people like them, they care what their life, you know what I mean? And I think being, beyond being a celebrity, being like a YouTube celebrity or being just like a, well, I guess what's known now in the YouTube or Instagram um, community, if you're big is known as an influencer, is people feel very connected to you. I mean, they, they, they want to know what you're doing. They want to know what your dog ate that day even, you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And they care because you're like a, you're, you're like a, you're a friend to them, you're a teacher to them if you're, if you're on like an educational type page, um, you're a mentor to them, you're like, you're, I mean, you're a celebrity to them, but it's a much more personal connection than just some celebrity that you maybe idolize because they're so good at guitar. I mean, you might respect them for being good at guitar, but that's not why you keep up with their content. You know what I mean? You're not, like, I don't subscribe to, I don't know, music is win because he's the best electric guitar player in the world. I mean, is he very good? Yeah, he's definitely very, very good. Um, but personally for me, if I want, like, I don't want to play electric guitar anymore, so if I wanted to learn maybe how to get better at sweeping, for example. Who am I gonna wa watch a video with a guy that's like one of the, the best shred gods out there that I 
maybe know who's famous, but I don't really know a whole lot about them. Or, oh, here's, here's my, my friend Tyler from Music is Wind talking about how to get started at sweet picking. You know what I mean? As a non-guitarist, non you're talking As a non-electric guitarist, I would probably pick that. Yeah. As a classical guitarist, if there was the equivalent of that for a classical guitar, or watching a video on like John Williams talking about scales, of course, most professional or aspiring professional classical guitarists are going to geek out over John Williams talking about how he does scales so fast. Sure. Yeah. But um, but again, I think it really is finding the niche, finding your market for who you want, who you want, who do you want to appeal to? And I think that my big thing to kind of go back to what you asked about, like where am I, where am I hoping to go with it, is I want to, I want to be, I guess, like like the people that don't really know anything about classical guitar, and if some great classical guitarist that's someone in my same field, we could say, like same level in terms, I guess like a colleague we could say, thinks like, oh, your videos are stupid and, you know what I mean, like, oh, you're, you're talking about that technique wrong, or oh, you know, you're talking about how to do tremolo, but your tremolo isn't that good. It's kind of like, well, great, I wasn't trying to make you happy, you know what I mean? I was trying to introduce the concept of tremolo to somebody who's maybe never touched a classical guitar before and used their fingers as picks, you know what I mean? And like, and if I get like some respect from the classical guitar community, being like, wow, you know, this person is a pretty good classical guitarist and he posts good videos, great. But that's not really my goal, you know what I mean? And so you got somebody, a tag from Elliot Fisk's wife. I got, yeah, and I got a tag from Elliot Fisk's wife, you know what I mean? Like, um, like if, and exactly, so if they like my stuff, they think, wow, this guy plays really well, awesome. If they hate it and they think I'm terrible, and they're like, oh, why, why should we listen to you? You're, you're, no, you're no better than so-and-so. I'm like, well, Well, I think, I think the real, I think because classical guitar has such a high threshold, like you, the, the entry price is mm -hmm. so high, meaning you have to be good or have a lot of study to, yeah. to really be able to formulate an opinion. I think the real ones recognize other real ones. And so I can't imagine people not having some sort of takeaway. It's sort of like, um, who's that guy from Virginia? The, the bald guy, the white guy. Oh, Sean, Sean, Sean Beavers. And he, so he does... Does is he he's he's still doing the Facebook and Twitter like constant lessons? I don't think he, I don't think he, I don't think he is anymore. I really liked his lessons. Um, yeah. he's, he's very very nice guy. Um, very, very nice. has very good information on like music, uh, business and music career building stuff. Um, very cool guy. So like um, your your I would say that your stuff is very similar to or, or let me put it this way. If you're talking about the education and the humor side, yeah. I feel like you have the humor side and are starting to build like his model, but yes. just in slowly incorporating more education uh, instead of just all all humor. Yes, I, I think that, that's, that's a great way to put it. Definitely, and um, and yeah, I think I I think kind of you said that like the entry point to classical guitar is so high, and for you to really be in on it, I think. As weird as it sounds, it's almost like I'm trying to lower the entry point. Not necessarily lower the entry point in terms of like, oh, well, if you're not, you can be not good and still be considered a classical guitarist, but lower it in the way. You're trying that, to make it more accessible for people. I think yeah, to, to, exactly. Make, make it more accessible. L lower, lower it in the way that it's okay to play, only play a piece like the locker room, but play it very well. You know what I mean? Right. Kind of the same way with electric guitarists. Like, yeah, if you only know basic bar chords and you can't shred and you can't do electric guitar scales at 120 16th notes um or 120 to the quarter in 16th notes um it's kind of like well okay cool nobody asks you to i mean i think right um and i think the cool thing with classical guitar and kind of what you said with the whole like when where classical guitar kind of is is it's like totally for, in my opinion at least and from what i've talked to a few other guitarists about is it's totally in the zone because it's still guitar you know what i mean like i think that's one thing a lot of guitar, classical guitarists and guitar players kind of forget is it's still a guitar. Yeah, it's a different technique. Yeah, there's different music played on it. But at the same time too, it's still a guitar. The guitar as a whole is still probably the most universally played instrument. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whether it's whether it's showing chords or whether it's shredding Van Halen licks or whether it's playing classical guitar. You know what I mean? It's it's still the guitar. I think that's the thing that I think people either force a barrier around class, which are like, oh, well, no, we're better than this, or oh, no, that's not cool enough for us, whatever side you go on. And I think it really is kind of burning down that that barrier on there. I find there's a couple of things that, that you mentioned that I think are interesting. I find that um, the negativity mm -hmm. is easy for me. It has been very easy to avoid, uh, mm -hmm. unless it was coming from me, but that required a, a sort of an internal 
uh, check, but the the negativity and like sort of the the ego measuring contest of mm-hmm. of those guitarists who who say, "How's your speed? How's your tremolo?" How's yeah, that I feel like that's very easy to to avoid. Totally, yeah. Um, and then the second thing I was thinking is, you said if you just want to play lagrima, you know, why can't that be respected? And I was thinking, what if more people knew what lagrima was? You know, every time I put on, um, I don't know. There's, uh, there's, I, I put on this, uh, the one of the Brahms piano quintets, mm-hmm. and it has like the it's G minor, and it has this uh, this really cool intro. It's, um, I'll find it later, and uh, you know, I'll put it on, and my wife will be like, "Oh, mm-hmm. I'm gonna go," uh, you know, this is gonna put me to sleep, mm-hmm. and like. I can't get mad at that. Why, why wouldn't she say something like that? Because yeah. she hasn't been like, and then the assumption is you have to come from this really artsy fartsy sophisticated mm-hmm. background to be able to appreciate something like that. So I think when you say I'm lowering the bar, I hear that as you're saying, come all ye enjoy the humor, enjoy me, enjoy this thing of classical guitar, which is actually pretty cool. Yeah, I think I think that that's really what, what it's been at lately too. And to, to kind of to go off of that too, like you said, with um, with like you putting on like um, one of the Brahms um, quartets or quintets, right? With that, it's like yeah, it's, it's like why why wouldn't they why wouldn't they say that? You know what I mean how much have they experienced classical music to really understand that? You know what I mean? Up until even like honestly, up for myself, even up until like three or four years ago, if I heard like classical like string quartets, I would be like, oh well, okay, cool, um, I, whatever, whatever, you know what I mean? And, um, but one thing I, I, I would say about the guitar, what's so cool is there's tons, tons of times that for fun, I would play classical guitar at open mics and obviously there are pretty much everyone there, maybe minus one or two people play guitar. Everyone at least playing is a singer songwriter. And so everyone has already has the connection to the guitar and I would go up and play pieces like sunburst, things that I knew were fun. And every single guitarist in the room would be like, wow, that was the coolest thing I've, I've ever heard. How'd you do that? You know what I mean? Yeah, and one, you know, I mean, yeah, it's. And, you know, I mean, and one, one, some of this is a cool piece, but it's not the, it's not the hardest piece in the world. I didn't play it the best in the world. You know what I mean? It's like, right. and like, and with all with those things still being put on the table, everyone was still like, "Whoa, that was the coolest thing I've ever heard." How'd you do that? You know what I mean? Right. Um, and I think that's what classical guitar is. I think I think that's where it. I think that's what it can be, and I think it's getting it to out there to people that aren't classical guitarists. I would say. Hannah mm-hmm. probably has a page where that's very accessible. Yes. Because all of her videos are well produced. Her guitars yeah. sound good. Uh, and she plays for the most part music that, that is very accessible. If you yes. like what you're seeing in the video and you like how mm-hmm. it sounds, then why wouldn't you, you go along and, and subscribe with the, with the, with the rest of the hundred thousand people that, that she's got. I don't exactly. say that. I don't say that in a sarcastic way at all. I mean, it makes yeah. sense. Um, um, and and there's the other channels too. Like, um, I don't know if you follow either Sam Griffin Guitar or Beyond the Guitar. Um, Beyond the I Guitar. I follow does, Beyond the Guitar. Yeah. So Beyond the Guitar does a lot of like movie arrangements. Um, he uh, movies and video game arrangements, whether it's Disney. Oh, on, the, on Instagram, yeah, I follow yeah, Fantasy. He, he, a lot of um, video game stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like, and again, like, there's that connection. I mean, he he's making the connection for you of like, hey. You guys like the music from Zelda. I mean, definitely a great soundtrack, whatever Zelda one you play. And he's like, here's the music in a way you haven't heard it. You know what I mean? And it's like, oh, wow, that was really cool. I didn't know that the guitar could do that. I wonder what more of this would sound like. You know what I mean? And that's kind of, that's kind of where it is. I mean, it's, it's bringing you into, into the realm of what the classical guitar is because you have a common denominator. And I think um, why people don't is just because there's nothing that connects them to. So for me, it's, for me, I guess the target is humor. You know what I mean? It's things that are interesting or intriguing, mm-hmm. right? Um, and all, I think everyone has their own angle. I think one thing that also really got me started was there, I read an interview with the Adario of Evan Toucher, and he um, he did an interview on like Instagram and kind of what it was. And what got me thinking is he said like, "What do you have? What are you going to offer that no one else is offering?" Because you know, what I mean, if I made another guitar page and it was just videos of me playing, it's kind of like, okay, well, cool. Like, why would I watch you play when I can? How would I? How would I even find you playing when there's? 20 other videos of other people playing the exact same thing better or worse right. i don't know but how am i even gonna gonna find your page right um so i think it, it really is um figuring out what you're gonna what you're gonna offer and what that kind of that common denominator that people are gonna be in whether it's the music you're playing whether it's how you're presenting the music right 
um, whether it's um, how you're titling your video, how your what the thumbnail of your video is, um, something that whether you're I guess whether you're aiming in the right place or not, something that people are going to see and be like, oh, I I think I can have an idea of what this is. Let's see what this is all about. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you're doing a good job of that, and you're you're connecting. Uh, I think both people that are already inside that community, and uh, and some people that are outside of that community that are that are being uh, brought in slowly. And mm-hmm. I think that that's wonderful. Um, before we go, is there yeah. anything that you want to promote? Uh, we'll have a we'll have a link uh, a list of links at the bottom um, uh, in the comments wherever this is on Instagram, YouTube. Uh, Facebook so that people can get to your stuff. But is there anything that you want to promote right now? Um, I don't think so. I, I guess definitely if you guys don't already really check my page on Instagram primarily. That's where it's at, the page for the classical guitarist. Um, check us out on YouTube as well. There are going to be more videos coming out very soon. Um, humor, informative, etc. Mixture of them. And definitely check us out on Facebook to kind of see all the stuff we're doing. Everything that is just the title for the classical guitarist. A mixture of humor, information, and now you got the uh, y'all got the scoop on the the curator and mastermind behind the whole project. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for uh, joining. I'm going to press the stop recording button. All right, sounds great. All right, I'll talk to you later.